My dream was climbing Mount Everest one day, and I was just out of medical school, I was in debt. I had a five-year bond with the Ministry of Health for sponsoring my part of my uh, education, and I had gotten into the orthopedic surgery training program in the first year of my housemanship year. And this dream that I had was to climb Everest, and I knew that I had to take one year of no pay leave. And I had to quit my residency, apply to the Ministry of Health, which was Terrible. It took me a long time, six months of red tape, because no one has ever done something like this before. And it involved me getting criticisms from family and uh, people at work. And of course, it involves me risking my life. So this is a picture of me on the 26th of May this year at 6.55 AM. Uh, after four years of planning, one year of intensive uh, training, and in, on the summit of Mount Everest. And in so doing, I became the first Singaporean to raise uh, uh, climb Everest for charity and the first Singaporean doctor. So to date, I've managed to raise about $45,000 for the Tan Tock Seng Community, Community Charity Fund where I work and also set up a clinic in Nepal and also helped out the school over there. So by looking at this picture, how many of you think by summiting the, mount, uh, the summit of this mountain, I was uh, successful? Raise show of hands. Okay, there are more hands now than the previous question. So this is where I would like to say many of you are actually wrong. Even if I hadn't summited the mountain, I turned away like 50 meters from the summit, I would still be the very enriched person that I am today. The journey that I took that started me off towards the summit taught me a lot of things, made me travel to a lot of places, embrace new cultures. And even if I didn't summit, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't be here talking to you guys if I didn't summit, but I would still be the person I am here today. And it's always the sides of the mountain that sustain the life, but not the summit. It's very true. And no one actually knows the sacrifices and failures that are involved in someone reaching their destination at, at one day. Always one side of the story that they always hear, but never the other side. Just to give you an illustration, this was one of my training climbs, Mount Mustak Atta, in Xinjiang, in China. And it was, we were totally underprepared for this mountain. As we were going up, it was bad weather, and we knew that it was not a wise decision of uh, proceeding on. When we were in Camp 2, we saw this bunch of Belgium climbers coming down hurriedly from the summit. We asked them, do you manage to summit? They were like, yes. And we were like, wow, okay, these guys are good. They're daring guys. Congratulations. And they hurried down back. And on Camp 2, we experienced very bad weather. We decided not to carry on, and we decided to come back down. And we were talking about these Belgium uh, climbers right from the start. And the other people told us these guys had actually lost their way from the summit coming down, they had lost their way. They had to dig a snow cave in the middle of the night and they slept there and, in, and then they came back down. And many of them suffered frostbite. One of the climbers was a physiotherapist and he suffered, he lost seven fingers due to frostbite. And we only knew about these stories once we came back down. And if you think about it, uh, the whole world would choose to look at their success. Like people like me, I just heard one side of the story, congratulations, and I chose to go on. Many of them back in Belgium also would think that congratulations, but there's so much more failure involved in what he just achieved. He lost seven fingers. His career lost, his future career, whatever he wants to do, is compromised as well. This was the picture that started me off. This was my inspiration. A, a friend of mine, a Romanian PhD exchange student, I was studying in National University of Singapore, and she was in the rock climbing team as me, doing the same things every day, training in and out. And during a break, she went to Mount Aconcogua, the highest mountain in South America, and she climbed, climbed this mountain. And when she came back, she posted this photo up. And I was thinking, wow, someone just like me, doing the same things as me, could do something so extraordinary like this. I was thinking, why can't I be the person? And I wanted to try this out and say, if someone just like that, you know, just the guy sitting next to you during lecture, can do something like that and say, I want to try it. And that's how my whole dream started. And so I googled the easiest, highest mountain in the world. And this was the mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro, in the uh, highest mountain in Africa. Only when I climbed there, I realized there's no such thing as an easy mountain. So when I was there, uh, the, the picture on the left is actually the ash pit, and we are walking around the crater rim. I was coughing heavily. I was totally underprepared for the mountain. 
I mean, thinking we are like sea level fit creatures, you know, I was getting gold for IPPT, I was among the f uh, best in my, my platoon a long time ago. I was thinking this shouldn't be a problem. 12,000 people climb it a, a, a year and about half of them make it to the top. So I shouldn't, it shouldn't be a problem for me. I was coughing heavily. One of the signs of pulmonary edema, which is a sign, which is a deadly form of uh, acute mountain sickness, AMS. When I reached the crater, the guide told me, your life is more important than the rock. The rock will always be there. You can always come back and take a photo of the rock. But I was not ready to give that up. It was just two hours from the summit, and I had given up so much time and money from my medical uh, uh, studying medicine. And I came all the way halfway, halfway across the world not to be turned around two hours from the summit. And we went on. So two out of six of us reached the summit. And I was thinking, wow, it's not, not too bad, you know. Uh, actually, training for one month, we managed to reach the summit. And that ego that was built up on the day I reached the summit was very bad. In a way, the subsequent mountains that I climbed from then, when I didn't manage to reach the summit of any mountain, the, it was a hard pill to swallow. I actually sometimes jeopardized my, my team's decision, their safety, and actually still wanted to go on just to reach the summit of a mountain. Just as it comes to show, ego in a newly accustomed is very bad for learning. This is a picture taken during uh, in Everest Base Camp um, with the many uh, nationalities who were there climbing with me. When you think you are the big fish in a pond, when you don't go out there, experience new, new ideas out there, you think that you are the best. You think that you are good. But only when you start interacting with people and opening up your eyes to the world, you realize that your level that you actually set yourself to is so much lower than what other people are doing out there. Just like me, when I was here, I was thinking I was pretty fit, trained for one year, planned plan for four years. I was among the top uh, fitness level mo uh, mountaineers in, in Singapore. When I, only when I went there, I realized that even a 48-year-old mother of three could climb faster than any of the whole bunch of people over there. That just blew me away, as in like, I was just setting myself at this level. Only when I realized that just another person like me could do something so much more, again, I started wondering, is my own mental boundaries that I set for myself, is that my limiting uh, lim limitations? Then, as I pose this question to everyone, everyone sets their own mental boundaries. Only when you go out there, when you meet people, do you actually realize and crush these mental boundaries and realize that you can good do, you're much better than what you think you are. You go out there and realize your full potential. This is an interesting form. Body disposal elective form. In case I die on the mountain, I prefer to be, number one, left on the mountain, buried, number two, cremated, or number three, repatriated back to Singapore. When I showed my dad this, dad, what do you like? <laughs> you can imagine, I can, I'll never forget that day when both of us looked at each other. And of course, I had to play down and say it's pretty safe, you know, don't worry, it's just to cover their, themselves, you know. Only when I was on the mountain, I realized it's actually very true. It's a very dangerous place out there. This was a picture from uh, Camp 1 of Everest, uh, going towards the Camp 2, uh, the Western Coom. On your right is actually Nupse. And in front of you, you can see a few uh, tents. This, this year, was very un uh, the weather was bad. The, it was very unstable. The weather was warm. There was a huge avalanche that came from Nupse that wiped out the entire Camp 1. And this dragged a Sherpa who was walking in the Western Coom into a crevasse, and he passed away. There was a friend of mine who was delayed in his uh, acclimatization cycle, and he took this photo. And he said, he came back down and said, uh, he called it quits. He told us, I know how is it like growing up without a father. And I don't want my two young kids to grow up without a father. And I think I've read about these experiences. I've read about the mountain, read, read about the Western Coombe, seen documentaries. And I think I'm lucky enough to have come this far. And I think I'm making the right decision. I think the rest of the world would think this guy gave up halfway. But only when they probe into the, the, the finer details will they know that, reali will they realize that this was a bigger success in him turning back than for him to actually have summited the mountain. And I think it takes a lot more courage to do this than to actually reach the top of the mountain. This was a human traffic jam that was, uh, occurred on the 19th of May this year. Very unique. Only this year it happened. 11 deaths. This year saw 11 deaths on the mountain. The highest number of deaths since the 96 tragedy, we saw 16 deaths. Many of the people were un unprepared. They were not carrying enough oxygen. They had not enough Sherpa support. Many people, 250 people, tried to summit the mountain on the 19th of May, a very single day, once the weather window opened up. Many of them were called by base camp to turn back because the oxygen was running out. But they were so straightforward minded, focused, they were so strong headed that they just wanted to reach the goal. And, and all the four deaths that occurred on the same day, all of them actually reached the summit and as they were coming down, they actually passed away. So it's not actually a very good thing to be too focused, 
to fulfill your success so-called plans because sometimes you get too carried away. This is one of the dead bodies that I saw along the way. Many of them actually, so one of them. Many years ago probably he, he, he passed away because of the torn and tattered uh, down suit. And in the bottom left of the, the screen you can see uh, his hand, the green skin on his hand, preserved in the cold dry air. There's no, no matter how much money you pay, it's impossible to bring down a body from, some, uh, from, from any part of Everest because it's just too dangerous and it's just impossible, the terrain. So in a weird sense, he was actually, if you think of it, one, one, somebody asked me, what if you fail? Four years ago, if someone asked me, what if you fail in submitting Everest? I told him as a joke, I'd rather die trying than not having tried to do so. And this is a very warped way of saying that you died on the mountain where you thought that your, your dreams were. So is success uh, dying is it a, is in a warped way? Is it actually failure? But this guy is, is resting in peace wherever where the, the many years that he dreamed of being at. And during the one year of no pay leave, I actually climbed six mountains in preparation for Everest. The first two, I didn't manage to reach the summit. But if society was to perceive a successful mountaineer as someone who climbed and summited as many mountains as possible, I think this is something that our society needs to change, a mindset that we need to change. Success is not always about summiting, let alone anything in life. It's not always about the destination, but it's about the journey. It's doing the big, the easiest mountain was the first mountain, Musak Atta in Xinjiang. And uh, Xinjiang borders Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and uh, Kazakhstan. And the people, the locals, are actually from this, uh, descendants from these uh, countries. And they're nomads. So this was one of my porters during the climb to Mustagata. So when I thought the, the easiest mountain was my biggest failure, but in, indeed, when I came back and shared these stories, it was indeed my biggest success. I'll tell you why. This guy was a porter. He, he climbs during the season, and he brings along all his kids along with him to stay in base camp. And uh, during, he has seven children, and four of them passed away due to the high infant mortality rate over there. So his kids, the remaining three kids were precious. One of them got scalded by hot water, and he was to take a break and go to the nearest medical facility would be a day's drive away. And that would mean that he loses a fraction of his working pay as well as he has to spend money bringing his daughter to the medical facility. So he chose to wait it out. And by the next day, the, the child was actually crying away in pain. That was when he was actually running from 10 to 10 looking for someone who could help him. And he stumbled upon me. I was a doctor. And all I did was just wipe off the Colgate that was smeared all over her face, change a new piece of gauze and, uh, gauze and put it over there and gave her some analgesia. And by the afternoon, she was running around and playing with the rest of the kids. And that evening, the father came down to me and told me a one line, a very solemn thank you. And that thank you, I have never received as a junior doctor working in Singapore so far. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that because that was my biggest success in what people would perceive as a failure. People ask me, how do I climb Everest? This guy is so fat. There's many ways to climb Everest. Some is to just go there solo. Some is to short rope. That means to tie your, your harness to a Sherpa and then he drags you up to the summit. You can hire three Sherpas and he drags you up to the summit. Or you can hire a helicopter that brings you up to the summit. But as I said, medicine is an apprenticeship. Uh, sorry, uh, climbing is an apprenticeship. <laughs> like medicine, like medicine. It's not how fast you get there. It's how you get there. It's the experience that teaches you a lot of things. I know of a friend whose first mountain was Everest, and he did manage to summit Everest. But while coming down, he faced so much of difficulty. He was risking his own life and his Sherpa's life because he didn't know how to repel, as in how to come down the mountain. Simple safety techniques of slipping in his carabiner. He didn't know how to do it. You can get to a certain destination as quickly as possible, and then you can ask yourself whether you're happy doing so. But a person who actually experiences the journey would have more experience and would be a happier person, I feel. And this is Mount Amadablam, the camp two of Mount Amadablam. These uh, yellow things that you see, see on this uh, rock tower are actually tents. I was wondering why do people actually pitch tents there. Only when I was there, I realized there's no space. So this is the only place left. And as you can see, eight hours of climbing on this uh, 80 degrees face of ice and snow to reach the summit. This mountain proved more physically and technically challenging than Everest now that I completed the two. Very rewarding pictures like what you can see here. And in so doing, we became the first Singaporean team to, see, uh, to reach the summit of this mountain. And when I actually took this story to sell, sell my, my, my plight of climbing Everest to sponsors and media, they were like, what's Amada Blum? This is something that you eat. 
<laughs> That's the response that I got. But for me, this was more harder. So how is success actually measured? If I, as I told you, if I come back 10 meters from the summit, I wouldn't be here talking to you guys, but I would not be, have been a changed person. My difficult journey, my Everest, was actually a long, hard journey leading to Everest, but not the summit of Everest. It's when people that I trusted and believed in, I asked them for help in terms of sponsors or some support, but they just refused. They told me, other people have done it, girls have done it, so what's so special about you? That's the response I got. Overcoming all these difficulties and telling myself that I can do it, that was my most difficult part of it, let alone everyone is climbing their own Everest silently, be it a handicapped person trying to go and get an education or, or someone who's trying to have a part-time work and supporting the rest of the family, or taking care of an aged parent, for example. Everyone is climbing their own Everest, and it should not be publicity that makes you have the motivation to climb your own Everest, because everyone, as long as you take the first step towards it, you are at the summit, and you know how satisfied you are when you reach the summit of Everest. Now that I'm back at home, I was thinking I'll come through the airport doors, my family waiting for me, I can, I can hug them and cry, cry with them and, and tell them about the stories. Instead, the people who rejected me, my, me and my sponsorship were there swarming the area and trying to get some photos of me and uh, press uh, me, media and stuff like that. So these guys are actually taking away the time I wanted to spend with my family and friends, the most, peop most important people there right from the start. And subsequently, they are still taking away the time that I've, I'm, I'm supposed to spend with family and friends. I'm still failing in a way, my family and friends, even though everyone considers me as a successful person who came down from Everest. In terms of work, everyone is re relating me to doctor who climbed Everest and not a junior doctor who's trying to rise up from the ranks through his own merit. It's extremely difficult going to a patient consult and say, oh, you are the one who climbed Everest. You should be able to diagnose me and treat me properly. <laughs> That's like abs absurd, I feel. It's like, why can't you just see me as a guy who's trying to become a good doctor and not as the guy who climbed Everest. And trying to come down this wave of success and write another one is the more difficult thing. Right now, that's my, my challenge. That's my Everest right now, to rise in ranks through my own merit. And sometimes you feel it's this, I like this uh, definition of success. It's the favorable termination of attempts. It's a mindset. It's a perception. Everyone has, has a chance to do it. It's the small things that make the biggest difference. And although how cliche it may sound, the failure is, failure is only true when you don't get up after you fall. People ask me, what's my secret of my success? I say, it's the multiple failures that I've faced that makes me who I am today, and not the success that's thrown to me right from the start. Sometimes people ask, what if you're lost? OK, this is a climb from Camp 1 to Camp 2. Two of my Hello friends, have decided to go back because they were feeling a bit uh, unwell and I was made to, not really made, I had, <coughs> I had to go forward to camp 2 because no one will know the path otherwise and I have a GPS with me, it maps out the path. So the, the guides, so the two of them have left and then two porters, they are nowhere to be seen, they are so fast, they are all the way up there, I can't see any of them. They asked to follow the, follow the footsteps. The footsteps are being uh, covered up with the snow too fast such that I can't even see anything. See, it's been this weather, this crappy weather the entire time. Can't see anything except for the, this few flags. It's 5,850 meters right now. I'm very tired. There's no one around and I have no information about what's going to happen next or where is camp to. <sighs> Why am I doing this? Hopefully I get back safe. Yeah, and the snow is damn thick. Wearing snowshoes like this also is like sinking into the snow. Okay. So, <laughs> I was lost. I was totally lost. Sometimes when you do something, when you get too involved in it, we ask ourselves always, why are we doing this? But always there's a reason for why anyone started doing it in the first place. Sometimes we need to take the step back and look at things in the big picture and ask ourselves why we started doing this in the first place. In that way, we can find a lot more passion and, and meaning in what we're doing. And once we're back at it, I think that it'll, it'll be not be a question anymore. Let alone, if you are lost, just take a step back. So my, just my take home messages, dream big and stay, stay true to your dream. If I hadn't dreamt of Everest, I wouldn't have been halfway there or, or beyond that. And always act on your dreams. There's no point just talking about it. And it's always perceptions. 
there's always a failure in every success and there's always a success in every failure. Or not all who wonder are lost. Yeah, thank you.